Welcome to the Vision Guided Life. I'm Olu Taiwo, and I'm here with my brother, Kay Taiwo. Kay, what do you have to say about today's discussion? This discussion today is it's very important in light of uh, us preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to go into uh, Paul's encounter in Macedonia, more specifically Philippi. And the, the encounter in Acts chapter 16 actually highlights a lot of things that the average Christian will have to deal with, and that is with society, how society responds to the gospel, economics, and also knowing our authority in Christ. They all come into play in this passage. What I see there just from the get-go is that it's our influence in society and its impact, which we could trace to who we are in Christ. But there's another dimension, and that is discipleship. In our, one of our last uh, shows, we discussed this about the word, uh, the word Talmudim, that meant disciple, that was just more than a casual acquaintance, but somebody who was actually living under the tutelage and is able to observe and live with the master and adapt the master's customs and ways of living. So it's more than just a casual acquaintance of sitting in a classroom and being given instructions. So that is primarily, to me, foundational to be able to become like the master. And with that fellowship and that kind of uh, uh, acquaintance that's just beyond just mere acquaintance leads into impact because you become like the master after a while. Absolutely. And that's very, very powerful. So let's take it to Acts uh, chapter 16. And let me start from verse 9. It says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed, prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So the vision that Paul saw was to preach the gospel. That was Paul's main mission. But Just because God gives you a vision to accomplish something does not mean that it's not going to be without without obstacles because God brings favor along Paul's path, but also obstacles that Paul had to face. Now, when he went into that town, God had people ready to to receive him, a woman by the name of Lydia, who was a seller of purple. Purple was supposed to be royal or or very expensive uh, fabric. They dyed the clothes in that purple. Purple was regal. It was it's people that were rich bought purple uh, clothes, and people that sold it made a fortune on it. So she was a very wealthy person. Now, when we think about purple, we also do think about it in royalty, even two thousand years late, later. Yes, and so she uh, accepted Paul into a house, insisted that if Paul uh, accepted her as a believer in Christ, that you know he invited. She invited him in with his entourage, and Paul stayed there. But while Paul was preaching the gospel, there was an encounter that's quite interesting, and I'm going to read from uh, verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masses much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So what she said is true, but the spirit behind it was not of God. And I find it's very interesting that Satan can mask himself in any form just to make you accommodate him, but just with a purpose of distracting. Because Paul, at some point, now saw that this person's utterances were interfering with his preaching of the gospel. The vision he saw was to preach the gospel in Macedonia. But this encounter, even though she was proclaiming Paul as a servant of of God to bring the good tidings, it was not the spirit of Christ. But the interesting thing is Paul did not rebuke her uh, the first time. Why do you think that is? I think that uh, Paul, first of all, heard it. Of course, the utterance, when you listen to what she was saying, it was positive. And in some case, I mean, put it this way, it was also true. Yes. It, it was true. Yet, Paul was grieved to reach the point where he 
You know, somebody can be declaring uh, something that is true, but you can discern that the spirit from which it's coming is not the spirit of God. So sometimes it could be to be draw attention to themselves. So yeah. sometimes they say, I know that person, I know that person, but in saying I know that person is not with the intent to help that person fulfill their, their purpose or destiny, but might be to draw attention to self. And so right. discern that this spirit speaking is not necessarily testifying to promote the gospel, but actually distract it. Paul yes. says that this spirit was distracting from the message. Yes, and, and in verse 17 and 18, we see that Paul was angry, and Paul turned and cast out the demon. But the Bible says that this demon-possessed woman brought her masters much gain. The word damsel, if you look at it, at it in, in the Greek, it actually means slave. She was a slave to these uh, owners who used her to profit. To make money all of fortune telling. And when Paul rebuked that spirit, Paul was dealing in the spiritual authority that he had in Christ. But in doing that, he stopped the economy of a particular group of people and they were not happy about it. Yes. So it is interesting that here, here is, and see, this is where the gospel comes in. Because when, when you're preaching the truth of the gospel, you don't intentionally go to disrupt a business. But the impact, when the power of God is at work in society through a, an individual or, or a group, people in a local assembly, that, uh, that local uh, group or local or community, when it begins to feel the impact of the gospel, something is beginning to change that may even affect the economy. You see what I'm saying? The economy of that area. And by so doing, you, you, while the gospel is not, we don't go intentionally to offend people. The nature of the gospel is that it is counter-cultural in nature. You see what I'm saying? Yes. And that's very powerful. So what ends up happening here is that this, uh, uh, the, the owners that now found out that they have now lost their source of income, they take Paul and his group to the marketplace. Interesting. That's where the magistrates were. Why the marketplace? Because not only did they want to uh, stop Paul, they wanted to make an example of him, and they brought an accusation. And the funny thing about this whole passage is that they articulated what Paul was doing, how they saw Paul. So basically, they paid attention to Paul, and as long as Paul did not affect their commerce, they didn't care what he had to say. But once Paul's message and obviously rebuking the demon out of that girl and he came out of there and stopped their business, now they were concerned about what Paul had to say. And that's sometimes how people look at things. Because when the gospel comes into a region, it's going to affect and impact people. People think it's not a big deal until it impacts their bottom line. So the gospel will enhance certain commerce. But at the same time, it will alter or stop certain commas. And that's also a test to the impact of the gospel in a region, especially when the gospel is undiluted. Yes. In other words, when we really come into society with the potency of the power of the Holy Spirit, we are preaching the word and not diluting it. I'm trying to make it, uh, how do I put it, everybody accept it. We just preach it out of love, but preach the truth undiluted. There's no way we will not make some kind of impact. Somebody will be mad or glad. In fact, that was what uh, Smith Wigglesworth said. Yes. No way you're preaching the word. There's no, you end up having no real middle ground. You're going to make somebody really mad or somebody really glad. But sometimes what we try to do is we try to dilute the word. And in, 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 in the process, the impact the word will have on society becomes compromised. Yeah. When we speak, and preach the word under the unction of the Holy Spirit. We speak as oracles of God prophetically into our society. It's going to shift the atmosphere. It will shift the very region where we are. And then some people will be set free and other people will be will be angry. So we, that also is another aspect. Because when you look at what happened, Paul entered a into a conflict with these people now. He's pulled into the marketplace because, like you said, the bottom line, the economy, once you touch a person's uh, economics, yeah, it, it, it immediately it begin to see reactions. Yes, and I uh, think we see the thing we always talk about about vision and uh, two dynamics. We see the big picture, 
and we see the details. The big picture is what Paul got. Go to Macedonia. Come on to Macedonia and help us. That was the vision Paul received. So they, without hesitation, prepared and left for Macedonia. But the thing is, the encounters that they had, Paul was imprisoned. Paul was uh, beaten severely before he got into prison, and they put him into the inner prison. And all those things were not in the vision that Paul received. And I think this is a point to encourage people that even when God gives you a vision for something to do, or a mission to accomplish, do not think that it's going to come without obstacle. It's not going to come without opposition. There will always be opposition to God's big picture. And we've always said that the big picture and the details are two dynamics. The big picture that you receive is doesn't it always tell you what the details uh, entail. And so just looking at the details, also you can lose sight of the big picture. And when you lose sight of the big picture, you get discouraged. Imagine Paul at that moment being you know, taken to the marketplace and being beaten and being thrown in prison. It's like, this is not what I saw. I, what I saw was come to Macedonia and help us. But Paul, in the end, looks like he's being hurt from the experience. But Paul was consistent because the Bible said that while they were in prison, Paul and Silas, they prayed and they sang and the prisoners heard them. In, isn't that something? Yeah, they heard them. So which means even though Paul was forced into a very uncomfortable situation, he remained consistent. I want you to think about that. Paul is put into a dungeon. He's put into a, a, a lock up in a very unfavorable uh, place. But that doesn't stop who he is. And because he had a relationship with God, that relationship with God, even in the midst of a prison situation, that that abundance comes out of it. And the prisoners, the people who were also captive, heard him, which means he still made the impact. So which means while he's locked up, he doesn't have the opportunity to be outside in the marketplace. But that doesn't mean his ministry stops. No. Nope. While he's in prison, he continues his ministry. And that's what we need to even learn from there. Yeah. That you are a minister, an agent of change, wherever you are, regardless of the circumstances. In other words, you don't need everything being conducive, everything going according to plan in the natural for you to be able to fulfill your ministry. Yeah. You could be in the most uncomfortable situation and still be witness. And also, let's emphasize the, the 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 side of it that we have authority in the name of Jesus. Yes, and we need to revisit that reality because many times we are attacking things that are going on in society from the natural standpoint. But we need to revisit what are the what are the spirits behind the forces that are moving society today. And let's be like Paul, understand our authority. Let's not. I guess maybe on light Paul, Paul uh, got to a point where it wore him out before he addressed it. We have to also sharpen our discernment and be able to use our authority in Christ to address the spirit that is behind the things that we encounter that may hinder our message. So on a macro level, Paul dealt with this individual and spoke to the spirit, but on a macro level, it now became something that involved the whole city because these people that were making money off of this girl made it something that was societal, that it became a mob issue. The mob got involved. The mob got angry over what Paul was saying. But then we see Paul do something as they tried to release him from prison. He asserts his citizenship. That's an interesting angle. What do you think about that? Thank you, Paul. Paul was not very... Uh... Full, fit, full of the spirit, but also full of wisdom. It was full of wisdom, and in its particular circumstance, Paul knew what to what tool to apply to help further his message and not be hindered. So he, he was a lawyer by profession. So he also understood the law, and that's very important. Christians sometimes, when we 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 have a knowledge of scripture, but we also need to know the laws of the land and know what our rights are so we can assert our rights when those uh, situations come about where we need to express our rights. Because if you don't know your rights, how can you know what to enforce? How can you know what to recite? 
And you see, it's interesting that when Paul brings up aspects of the law, he takes the opponents in this society by surprise. When he now asserts I'm a Roman citizen, they're like, oh my goodness, what, is, what have we done? Yeah. If you don't know your rights, you, you, you cannot recite your rights. So you need to know your so we need to be well-rounded in everything we do, well-rounded in the scripture, also well-rounded in the laws of the land. We can't be ignorant Christians. A day of being ignorant Christians, uh, that day is over. Yes, that is a very powerful connection. So the very same person that stood in the authority of Jesus' name also asserts his citizenship in that land. Yes. And that's to show you that you have to have a grasp of your rights. Because what Paul did there actually affect the gospel, affected the gospel going forward. Any other person that comes in the name of Jesus after Paul, before they jump to a conclusion, they will first try to find out, are you a Roman citizen? Because there were certain rights that were given to Roman citizens, and they knew that they, out, they stepped out of bounds in how they addressed Paul if indeed he was a Roman citizen. So Paul knew that, and he threw it in the mix, and they wanted to quietly come and release him. And he said, no, 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 have them come here and do the proper thing. So that tells you that knowing your 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 rights as a citizen, your civil rights as a citizen, can also have some impact on, on the preaching of the gospel. And sometimes people take things to an extreme. Any truth that's taken to an extreme becomes error. But what we're just say, simply saying is that there is a place to know your rights on the earth, right? Yes, this was a precedent-setting event because yes. Paul is a pioneer in the gospel. True. Do you have any other person to refer to to say, oh, I saw it so-and-so preaching the gospel, do this. So he was like setting the tone. He was like a forerunner. Yes. Example of a forerunner as going ahead of us, showing us that know the word, but also know the law. But I want to go back to what you said earlier, and that's in terms of the power of the Holy Spirit. Many cases is so true that we have attempted to apply only natural things. In some cases where there should be a supernatural dimension, we apply the natural. And I think that's where a lack of emphasis on the Holy Spirit in our day. Because many cases, look around messages, look around uh, uh, church conferences. Many cases you will hardly hear about the Holy Spirit. But yet when you read the book of Acts or the Acts of the Holy Spirit, really, if you want to really name it correctly, is an activity of how the Holy Spirit moved in and through the church. Yeah. But in, in today's uh, uh, world, you many times do not even hear the Holy Spirit being mentioned, talk less of being ex having him express himself. And if you're going to make the impact, like we saw in the first uh, century church, we have to come back to a consciousness of the power and the demonstration of the Spirit. We're not talking about something crazy, people uh, doing stuff that is uh, out there that is not in, in keeping with the Word. We're saying being conscious and being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and letting the Word guide us because that's how we make impact. The Word informs us. The Holy Spirit empowers us. And when we have the Holy Spirit and the Word working together, that's how we make impact on society. What, uh, I guess, admonition would you give the body of Christ at large? Are we uh, preaching the gospel in the way we should be? Or what, what, what may be lacking that we need to do as a body of Christ? I think it goes back to what we said at the beginning and what we said in the previous program, discipleship. We need to go back to the scriptures. I mean, really go back into the scriptures, dig into the scriptures. And when I say dig into scripture, I mean Acts of the Apostles on. Go back into the into the, the first century church, the mandate that Jesus gave that the uh, power shall come upon you, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Go and study what does this mean? How does this apply today? And if we're not seeing this happen today, why aren't we seeing this? And see, what's interesting that over periods of times in the 80s, we remember what we saw in terms of uh, the power of the Holy Spirit and how we got introduced into uh, the dynamics of the Spirit. But in, in, we see that over as decades passed, there's a lack of emphasis on, on these areas. And we've gone into a kind of a how-to type of situation in the church too. How to do this, 10 steps to this. But sometimes we just need to go back to the basics and go back to the Word. What does the Word of God say? 
how was a first century church effective? Ask these questions and ask ourselves, are we seeing the same impact or more? Because really, that was a launching pad. We should be far ahead. So uh, you, you ask that question, I say, let's go back to the scriptures. And in fact, let me even add this. In some sense, remove from your mind that you already know these things. And that's what hinders many people, that is that they already come into the scriptures with a preconceived notion that they know it. So just approach it as if you don't know it. I'm reading the scripture for the fir- very first time. That's how we should, ap- we should approach it. They are reading the scripture for the very first time and see it. This is the foundation of the church. Are we seeing this now? If we're not seeing it, why? Right. That's powerful. Very powerful. And uh, that is the mindset that we ought to have in approaching God's kingdom mandate for us. Always keep the kingdom mandate in view. Never lose sight of the kingdom mandate. Yes, yes. And then you read in Matthew chapter 4, uh, when Jesus says, uh, follow me and I will make you Christians of men. Going back to that very word discipleship, that's what he's talking about. Follow me, which means follow my pattern of living. Follow my way of living. Follow how I react to situations, to life, and to the mandate. Because Jesus was constantly talking about what he came for. Yes. We never lose sight of what we're here for. Because the moment we lose sight of what we're here for, we begin to make other things priority. Other. True. And then we get into trouble, we get distracted, and we lose sight. And then we begin to take sides with the society that actually hinders the gospel. That's going on too. So we have to know whose who side we're on. Exactly. And there's no debate. If you're a child of God, you represent the kingdom. And you should be acquainted with the kingdom. The kingdom should be everything that you are yes seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you so the kingdom becomes a priority as i wake up as i'm living on a business doing a business deal i'm thinking about the kingdom as i'm uh relaxing i'm thinking about the kingdom and and it should be a joy jesus said my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work so it becomes something that you, you is it, it's, not a, it's not something you're forced to, it's something that becomes your joy. Yes, that's very powerful, very powerful. And and when you do that, you will eat. come what may, obstacles notwithstanding, you stand in God's plan and you will have the perspective of the kingdom in mind. Exactly, you have the perspective of the kingdom. And that's why Paul, in, the, in prison, still had the perspective of the kingdom. So what yes. is, is the... The culture of the kingdom, the culture of the kingdom is praise. Yeah. And so in the midst of a circumstance that is so uh, uncomfortable, I'm sure it was very uncomfortable, but Paul's culture, kingdom culture, was manifested in the prison. And that's why that culture, because the prisoners listened to him, because the prisoners are thinking to themselves, these guys are where we are. This is such an uncomfortable place to be, but they're still praising their God. Who is their God? Yeah. Something different about them. There's a culture that of which they operate that is above the culture that we are part of. Yeah, and that's made, that made a tremendous impact. That the Holy Spirit came and shook the prison, so yeah. their physical uh, fetters were broken. So you just you just unlocked a key right there because they continued in the kingdom culture. It became a platform for the Holy Spirit to manifest. Wow, powerful, powerful. So many times what is what happens in, in today's uh, church sometimes is uh, we don't maintain that kingdom culture, but we want the Holy Spirit to manifest. Hmm. Interesting. So we, we, we're doing the kingdom culture daily as a matter of lifestyle. The Holy Spirit can come. And that's another thing, too, because the, we, we cannot always dictate how the Holy Spirit is going to operate. All that's true. Dictate how the Holy Spirit was going to sh- uh, shake that prison. That's true. He pro- perhaps said no, but what he did control or could control was maintaining the kingdom culture of glory. Yes. He did that in the in the spirit of the kingdom. The Holy Spirit was able to manifest. So if we do that daily, where we cultivate reading the word, meditating upon the word, praying, and also saying, God, we are open for you to manifest as you see fit 
Yes. Have a lot of suddenlies begin to ask. Absolutely. That's true. Because very easily, Paul could have had a pity party on himself. Like, God, you told me we, and God, did that miss it? <laughs> That's a, the refrain that many people have. Did I miss something? When I saw, I saw them say, come and help us. And here I am in a, in a cell. No, Paul did not take his eyes off of his mission. He praised and he prayed. And God responded in kind, right? God respond. We pray that the Holy Spirit will help us. Amen. In our generation, we would be those who respond in kind. I want to thank you for tuning into the Vision Guided Life. Remember this a transformation takes place through identification with Christ. God bless you. Remember to like, subscribe, and click on the bell so you will never miss any episode from our channel. God bless you.